Hello everyone. We are going to begin our discussion of the new chapter on material behavior. Uh, all of you are familiar with you know, some description or the other of material behavior, perhaps in the form of the widely known Hooke's law. And we will ultimately be discussing something along that line. But uh, in this relatively advanced course on applied elasticity, let me try to see uh, if we can motivate the need to discuss this material behavior in the first place. So towards that end, what, what I will do is, I'll first take stock of the various equations that are available to us from our studies in the previous two chapters, and then try to see uh, what we are missing. Okay, and perhaps a, a realization of what we are missing will help us uh, towards, uh, towards a discussion of material behavior. So back in the chapter on stress, we had spent a considerable amount of time discussing the balance of linear momentum. And while discussing that, we had mentioned that the information about the balance of mass or the conservation of mass was embedded in it. So let us first consider the balance of mass or the conservation of mass. For that, uh, the equation that we have is the continuity equation del rho del t plus divergence of rho b. That's equal to zero. Now, uh, uh, as I had mentioned in the in the in our discussion of the stress chapter, although our uh, our first encounter with this continuity equation is in fluid mechanics, but uh, it is very much true that this equation, this continuity equation, is true in uh, or uh, absolutely needs to be satisfied in the con context of solid mechanics also. Now, let's take stock of what we have here. You see we have the density here, which in general will be not known. We also have the velocity vector here involving its three components. Now, uh, usually, as you have seen uh, in elasticity or solid mechanics, mechanics of materials, we don't usually talk about velocity. Okay, we talk about displacements, but uh, that's not a problem because uh, we know that the velocity vector is easily connected or defined in terms of the displacement vector. Okay, so if we know the displacement, we actually know the velocity. So in so in a sense, what we are uh, what we really don't know uh, is the displacement here. Okay, because if we know the displacement, then the velocity is known. If we don't know the displacement, we don't know the velocity. Okay. So, uh, in terms of the number of unknowns and the number of equations, what we have here? So, this equation is just one equation, okay, but it has three unknowns. What are the three unknowns? The, the unknown, uh, so the, uh, the three unknowns are the density and the, the three components of the velocity v1, v2, v3 or equivalently u1, u2, and U3, the three unknown displacement components. Okay. Next, from the balance of linear momentum, we ended up with the Cauchy's equation of motion, which also had this term involving the velocity on the right hand side, on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, we had this divergence of the stress tensor plus the, uh, the body force term. Okay, now uh, implicitly here, I have already utilized the, the fact that sigma is equal to sigma transpose. And as mentioned in the earlier chapter again, uh, that follows the symmetricity of the stress tensor, sigma equal to sigma transpose, it follows from the, uh, from the balance of angular momentum. Okay, so we are implicitly using this sigma is equal to sigma transpose here. So the information from the uh, balance of angular momentum is very much embedded here. Uh, you also note that the balance of mass information is also uh, embedded here, but I wanted to take stock of the number of equations and unknowns in a separate fashion here. Okay, uh, now in terms of the new unknowns here. Okay, so we'll consider the six independent components of the stress tensor as the unknowns. The, the the components of the b vector those will not those will not be the unknown components rather they are known okay for example uh, 
the body force due to gravity or maybe due to some electromagnetic force they will be the known uh, terms uh, so in terms of uh, the equations and unknowns what we have from here you can either consider it in this form or uh, the, the the equation from the static equilibrium uh, point of view uh, which is of direct relevance for our studies in applied elasticity that we have delta dot sigma plus rho b okay uh, for static equilibrium we don't have any acceleration okay so how many equations are here we have three equations here and uh, the number of new unknowns is six okay the six unknowns so these are basically the six independent components of the stress tensor so in total what we have here we have four equations and we have three unknowns here and six unknowns here uh, so basically 10 un uh, sorry i made a mistake here so this we don't have three unknowns here we have four unknowns here so that's a correction uh, that i need to make the three unknowns here only pertain to this so uh, let me correct this these are four unknowns four unknowns so in total we have uh, one plus three four equations and four plus six ten unknowns okay so that's the balance sheet here four equations and ten unknowns so we have a discrepancy or shortage of six equations so to speak where do we get this six equations and this is what motivates us to discuss the material behavior because that material behavior description is what is going to provide us with the six equations that we need okay so going to the next page the six equation uh, six equations will be provided through our description of the material behavior so without going into any specific kind of material behavior let's just say as an example that we have the material behavior represented in this generic form So, for example, from our very, very uh, familiar instance of uh, of the Hooke's law, where we have uh, the for the uniaxial case, the sigma is equal to e times epsilon. Uh, so, this is a more generic version of that. Okay. So, uh, now you note that although we have introduced six equations, and apparently it seems that the six equation discrepancy has been uh, mitigated, but that is not really true. Because in the process of providing these six equations, we have ended up with introducing the strains. Okay, so if the stresses were not known to us, we cannot generally assume that the epsilons or the strains will be known to us. So we have to acknowledge the fact that in the process of introducing the six equations, we have also introduced six more unknowns. Okay, but we have ended up in uh, introducing six more unknowns six more unknowns into the fray okay so these six unknowns are the six independent components of epsilon but you note that this uh, this is uh, rather taking a naive view of things because uh, epsilon is not really uh, unknown. Okay, why? Because, uh, uh, however, we already know or we already have uh, the. Uh, let me rephrase that uh, we already know the uh, 
the six screen displacement relations. Okay, so uh, what we have here is now, uh, so, uh, so back in the kinematics chapter, you came across this thing. So epsilon ij is equal to half del ui del xj plus del uj del xi. Okay, so uh, or in, uh, in a more compact notation, so what we have here is half grad of the displacement vector plus transpose of that. Okay. So overall, what we are, what we have. So in the previous page, we had uh, let's take let's just take a look at the end of this balance sheet. We had four equations and ten unknowns. Then we had six equations here. Okay, six equations here we got six more unknowns and then we have the six strain displacement relations so uh, from the previous page four equations four six more equations here and again six more equations here okay so this is a total of 16 equations in terms of equations we have these many and in terms of the unknowns in the previous page we had these 10 unknowns the row the three components of the displacement the six uh, independent components of stress and in this page the only new unknowns that have been introduced are the six independent components of strain please note that while we were disc while we uh, while we presented these six Strain displacement relations in this form, these uh, displacement vectors are not uh, should not be counted again because back in the first page we have already counted them as the unknowns. Okay, so we should not count them again. So in total, what we have is from this page ten unknowns, and on this second page we have six unknowns, the six uh, uh, independent components of strain. So ten plus six is equal to 16 unknowns. So overall, the balance sheet is balanced now. Okay, 16 equations and 16 unknowns. So that's the story. Okay, so uh, as long as we are able to provide the six equations uh, describing the material behavior, uh, for example, in this kind of a fashion, then uh, then we are good. Of course, please note that this is only an example. It may very well be possible that the sigma is not only dependent on epsilon but is also de dependent on the epsilon dot for example as it happens uh, in fluid mechanics okay uh, for example as it uh, as it may happen uh, in describing viscoelastic behavior but we are not interested in those kinds of things uh, very specifically for our purpose of applied elasticity uh, will be concerned with these kinds of relations okay now uh, so going forward what we want to do is we want to invoke a few assumptions okay because we want to go to some uh, specific form of this material behavior this this generic relation that we wrote in the previous page about sigma is equal to f of epsilon from that very general abstract kind of form we want to go to something more uh, more concrete okay and towards that end uh, what we'll do is we'll invoke certain assumptions uh, some simplifying assumptions. So some assumptions to describe material behavior. The first assumption we are going to make is the assumption that the, the material behavior will be linear in nature. Okay, so linearity is the first assumption. Linearity means whatever the relation may be between sigma and epsilon, there should not be any powers involving greater than one. Okay, uh, uh, or 
or more strictly speaking, there should not be any power uh, involving anything other than one. Okay, it's not just greater than one, it cannot be less than one also. Okay. Uh, next, this is very important that there will be no rate or history effects. So if rates were involved, then uh, things like epsilon dot, okay, the time derivative of epsilon would be involved. For example, uh, if history fix were included, then perhaps it would uh, represent something like viscoelastic behavior. So at least for our course of applied elasticity going forward, we are not going to consider any such rate effects or history effects. Next, we are going to assume uniform or homogeneous behavior of the material. All right. So if we if we proceed with these assumptions, then a general relation which we can write down between the stresses and the strains will be in this particular form. Okay, so from going from the general description uh, in terms of sigma is equal to f of epsilon, which we uh, which we discussed in the previous page, we are writing down a more specific form in this way. So sigma ij is equal to this fourth order tensor Cijkl, which will be referred to henceforth as the elasticity tensor. That doing a double contraction with this strain tensor epsilon kl. It's a double contraction here because you note that two of the indices here get repeated. So k is repeated over these two and l is repeated over here. Okay. So uh, with this, we are going to end this part of the discussion and in the next part, we'll see uh, how uh, some more simplifications and further considerations can be added to go to more specific forms of this relation. All right, uh, with this, we end this part of the discussion then. Thank you very much.